sometimes I think we'd be better off if we just stopped, started counting, and things would look a whole lot better. Amen. All right, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verse 4. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, and when you find your place, I do ask that you rise in honor of God's word. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we began looking at the series on the Ten Commandments, and here we are at, at commandment number two. Let me repeat this before we go to the Lord in prayer. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Let us pray. Lord, our gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. Lord, we want to thank you for your mercy, your grace, God, that you have uh, given to each and every one of us. Lord, as we look at this, Help us to view it on how to apply it to our lives. The purpose, the objectives of this commandment. God, there could be somebody here that's never allowed you to be their Savior. Lord, I'm praying for that individual right now that you'll touch their hearts and let them see that they're lost, let them see that they need a, a forgiveness. And God, I pray that they'll come to know you. And Lord, for the Christian here today, Lord, allow us ears to hear and a mind to understand through the spirit of understanding. And God, I just pray, Lord, hide me behind your cross. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, thou shalt not have any graven image. Pretty simple, right? When you think about it. As as simple as this commandment is, there's also some complexity with it. I mean, if that was just a, as far as it went, you know, where would the understanding be? And as we look this morning, we'll, we'll think of this. So let's just give it a first simple glance, right? We see here that this commandment, uh, my mind goes straight to uh, figurines, to statues, to monuments, and, and stuff like that. Because you know what? There is people today that still worship statues and, and trinkets and, and imagery. I mean, it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. You can't even go to a marshal without a Buddha. Or a Hindu God. I mean, it's everywhere. Everywhere you look, it's upon us. And we understand that this is a serious issue, but this is where we first go. To the imagery. You see, but, but uh, upon studying this, we can better see and comprehend the objectives of this command and how it will help us to carry out the heart of God, because as we looked at it, when God wrote these on the Ten Commandments and he gave them to Moses, he said, go teach these. For the people could see the heart of God. There's got to be more than not to have some type of figurine. There's got to be more to it than, than just not to have any graven image, because I know that there's probably not a Christian in here that would have some type of graven image in their home. So there's got to be more to it than that. Okay? There's got to be something more to it. Now, before we go any further, I don't want us to go smash everything that you may think there could be something wrong with. All right? This is not what this is about. Because God has used symbols and monuments throughout the Bible. I think about the rainbow. Wasn't that a symbol to humanity that has been disgraced and perverted today? All right, let's think about another monument 
You know, the first thing that popped in my mind when I started thinking about a monument that God had established, it's when they crossed the Jordan River, right? When they crossed the Jordan River, they told the priest to get 12 stones. And we're going to set it in the midst of the river for a monument. Let's look at it. I, I love this story. Let's go to Joshua 4. I mean, Joshua 3 with us. I may have told you lies. Joshua 4. Joshua 4. I get ahead of myself here. Now, let's look on down here to verses uh, 15, and I want to look at verses 15 and, and, uh, 15 and 17 here in Joshua 4. And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of the Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded that the priests, saying, Come up out of the Jordan. And it came to pass that the priests that bore the ark would come up out of the midst of the Jordan, and the soles of their feast priests were lifted up on the dry land, and the water of the Jordan returned into their places and flowed over all the banks and did so. Now, so what we have is we set this monument, and that's what I did mess up. It is chapter 3. So let's go back. Let's, let's make a little bit more sense here. Y'all forgive me this morning. I got a lot on my mind, and please forgive me. 15 and 16. And as they bore the ark, where they come to the Jordan, and defeated the priests that bore the ark, were dipped into the brim of the water, the Jordan overflowed its banks. All right? It overflowed its banks, that the waters which came down from above stood and arose up, and the heat was very far from the city of Adam, and it was there tan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea failed, and were cut off, and the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the, of the covenant that stood in, in stood firm on the dry ground and in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry land or dry ground until the people were passed clean over the Jordan. Okay, so let me set the stage a little bit better here. The crossing of the Jordan was a monumental event because it was over flooded. It was over flooded. As soon as the priests set their foot in the water, it stopped. Now, make a note, if you want to, make a note right there that it went all the way 16 miles upstream. It wasn't just this little part of the water that the priest went through. 16 miles from where they're at upstream, the wall of water goes up. That's a pretty big event. There was 16 miles of dry land. We can't even comprehend riding in a car very long, like 16 miles. It's like, what? But 16 miles upstream. Now, let's go to Joshua 4, 21 and 24. It says, and it was talking about the, the, the stone monument and was talking about picking up the stones. But right here, it talks about this. In verse 21, And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, when, when the children shall ask their fathers in what time to come, saying, What mean these stones? The twelve stones. What means these stones? What means these stones? If you think about it, then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over the Jordan on dry land. So God uses monuments, don't he? He uses monuments to bring what? Our remembrance back. It was never meant to be worshipped. It was never meant to be worshipped. It's to remembrance. You see, it was to remind them of the awesomeness of God. There's another thing that I know that God used. Anybody, anybody remember the bronze snake? Bronze snake. Let's go back. Let, let's see here. Let's see if I can get the verses right for you to start with, okay? Numbers 
21. Numbers 21. Numbers 21, I want to go down to verse 4. Numbers 21, verse 4. Now, we know the command, right? Thou shalt not have any graven image before me, right? And so now, this was after the commandments was given. Check this out. And they journeyed from the Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea, who can pass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and, and against Moses, Wherefore have you brought us up out of, the land, out of Egypt to, dry, to die in this wilderness? And there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathes this uh, light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away these serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it up on a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, Shall live. Shall live. So God made a bronze serpent and set it in the midst of the field. I think there's a pretty amazing illustration, all right? Now, if you got too far and you couldn't see the cross or the, the pole lifted up with the brazen serpent on it, if you got too far and you couldn't see it, you'd die. But if you got to where you could still see and turn around, if you got bit and turned to the cross, you'd live. What type of prophecy? Even Jesus talks about this. Even Jesus talks about it in John chapter 3, verse 14. If you don't want to turn over there, I'll read it to you very quickly. John chapter 3, verse 14. It says, And Moses lifted up a serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. We know that that was a mosaic or a messiah, a messiah prophecy. That Jesus would one day be uh, held up on a cross, and whoever would turn to that cross should live. But was the serpent ever supposed to be worshipped? Or was it was a reminder? It was a reminder. Do you know what happened? They began to worship the brazen serpent. How do we know this? Well, let's go over here to 2 Kings for just a moment. 2 Kings chapter 18. I know it feels like we're playing sword of the Lord this morning, right? How many scriptures can we get in in one message? All right. But 2 Kings, Second Kings 18, I want to look at verse 4. All right, in 2 Kings 18, verse 4, it says, He removed the high places, and we're talking about Hezekiah, okay? It says that... Uh, and he removed the high places and, and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Do you see that? Something that was supposed to be a reminder of Christ had to be destroyed because that was what they was worshiping. That was what they was worshiping. Let me finish on. And break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Letitian or Natashtan. You know where the medical field gets their snake? Here. 
healing. Healing. It was bad with healing. Well, we could get stuck right there, couldn't we? Remember, thou shalt not have any graven image before me. See, I told you it's a very simple, but man, ain't it complex. Right? It's complex. Now, I want you to think about what was going on. There, they just crossed the Red Sea. Moses was meeting with God, right? Meeting with God and given this commandment. And what was the children of Israel doing? They wanted an idol made. Now, let's think about this, okay? Let's just, let's just think about it. They just saw the Red Sea part. You got it. They just saw the Red Sea part. It wasn't a creek, right? If it was a creek, well, man, it's even a bigger miracle that the whole Pharaoh and all his army drowned in the creek. So either which way you want to look at it, this was a miracle, right? He, they just split the Red Sea. They just crossed it on dry land. Saw the Pharaoh and his army smothered up, and then they finally hear from God. They was afraid to touch the mountain. Moses goes up, given the Ten Commandments, and they want an idol to worship. We got to go over here. Uh, let's turn back to Exodus 32. Maybe your hands won't be sore by the end of this message from flipping. But Exodus 32, I want to look at 7 and 8. Because can I tell you that God knows everything? Okay, God knows everything. He knows what's going on, even when he's telling us his commandments. And the Lord said unto Moses, we're looking at 32, Exodus 32, 7 and 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, go get thee down uh, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They had corrupted themselves. Why? Because they needed a God, a tangible. You remember that word? Tangible. Something they can hold on to. Right? You know the problem in this world today? We want a tangible God. A tangible God. They wanted something that they could tangibly see, could touch, even though it was nothing more than some melted earrings. That's it. They have corrupted themselves. They had forgot what God had done. They even forgot the prophecy that had been fulfilled. Did you know Abraham prophesied this? Back in Abraham chapter, I mean, not Abraham chapter 15. What kind of Bible is he using, right? Genesis 15. Let's go over there. I want you to see this prophecy. I, I want to show you how easily we forget uh, Abraham 15. And just look at, at 13 and 14. Genesis 15, 13 and 14. It says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs. And you shall serve him, and they shall afflict them 400 years. <gasps> They was in slavery just to the Egyptians. You, prophecy was fulfilled by Abraham, by the captivity, but this is not where I want to stop. And also the nation whom shall 
they, they shall serve, will I judge. And afterwards, they shall come out with great substance. Stop right there. Not if, if that wasn't enough, if that wasn't enough, what happened? Well, God told them what was going to happen, and it happened. Would you go over here to Exodus 12 now? I told you, your hands are going to be tired by the time we get done today. That's why you got the Ten Commandments with you. You can write it down, right? Exodus 12, 35 and 36. Exodus 12, 35 and 36. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels, silvers, jewels of gold and raiment, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so they let unto them uh, such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They got their riches just like Abraham promised through the prophecy of God. It wasn't enough that they had the tangible promise of God. They wanted some idols. Something tangible. Now, I'm not going to go back over there, but in Exodus 32, 22, when Aaron was confronted, I, I love this. I just see Aaron now fidgeting. He said, well, I just threw all this stuff in there, and it popped out two golden calves, like a Pop-Tart out of the toaster. No shaping, no molding, just... He had to shape them. He had to shape them. I do want to read something from Exodus 32. In, in Exodus 32, verse 22, check this out, and I, I think it applies here very well. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of the Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. Why are we set on mischief? Do you know that God knows our tendencies as mankind? To worship something tangible. It's hard for us not to. Because we was designed to worship. You know that? We was designed to worship. When God designed Adam and Eve, God was tangible. You get that? God was tangible. Adam could literally touch God. Now, one day we'll be able to do that when we get our glorified bodies. Tangibly touch God. All right, what happened? Sin. Sin happened. Unholiness came in. You know what? That put a separation between mankind and God. That only can be bridged through the blood of Jesus Christ. But think about it. We was made to worship something tangible. This is how, just how easy it is to get caught up in a graven image. Imagery. Trinkets. And stuff like that. Because we want a tangible God. Listen, over in Acts 14, uh, we can turn over there right quickly. I'm trying not to bother y'all too much with all this turning. You might want to jot, us, jot it down, but in Acts chapter 14, we're dealing with Paul and Barnabas, right? In, in Acts 14, let's look at verses 12 and 13. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius, which is Mercury, because he was a chief speaker. 
Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before the city, brought oxen and garlands into the gate and would have done sacrifices with the people. They wanted to put that Paul and Barnabas with Jupiter and Mercury because they were sent from God. I mean, you see the, the thing that, that, that they want tangible? They couldn't reach Jupiter. They couldn't reach Mercury. But Paul and Barnabas was going to be it for them. They was going to be it, something tangible. This is what he was trying to express in his commandment. We are not to worship the items of God or the items that God uses or that he has made. We should, uh, he should be in the center of worship. He should be the center of worship. Nothing else. And this is where the problem lies. You see, these commandments will not be grievous. You see, we are not to rely on sight, are we, when we worship God? We walk by faith, not by sight. We do not need anything more tangible than the promise that God gave us. That's it. Our salvation is not based on nothing else but grace. Period. Grace and grace alone. You see, we have to stop relying on sight. On sight. I'll take it just a little bit further. Let's think about one of the most monumental things in our Christian faith. The cross. Let's take it a little bit uh, further. What was the cross? It was the altar. Plain and simple. It was the altar. It was the altar that Jesus died on. Here's where it gets interesting. Let's go back to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, and I want to go all the way over to verses 22 through 26. And the Lord said unto Moses, Thus thou shalt say unto the people of Israel, Ye have seen, and I have talked with you from heaven. But you shall not make with me gods of silver, neither shall you make any you gods of gold, an altar of earth thou shalt make unto me, and shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering, and thy peace offering, thy sheep, and thine oxen, in this place where I record my name, I will come unto thee, and I will bless thee. And if thou will make an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it or hew stone. For if thou lift it up the tool upon it, thou hast polluted it. Do you get that? The graven part. If you touch it. If you shape it, you have polluted it. Let me finish. Neither shalt thou go up by the steps unto mine altar, that thy nakedness be discovered thereon. Wow. You see, it, it, it's like he knew that if we touch that altar, that we make it about us. We would shape that altar out of preference. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? We might shape this altar out of convenience. You see, when man 
touches anything that God's ordained, leave her there. God says, do not touch my altar. Do not add to it nor take away. That's a big issue in this land today. Adding to and taking away what God's ordained. Buddy, that's getting into that graven image I'm talking about. A shaped religion. Formed not on grace, but on preference, convenience, And all the other things that you want to add in there. God said, don't touch it. You know what? We receive something called grace, right? One of the most amazing things that's ever happened in my life. And this grace did not come because I deserved it. It came because God gave it freely to an unworthy person that could never do anything to gain it. I can't do anything for it to be took away. Thank God for that work. It's there. But there is people wanting to add to grace and take away from grace each and every day. We've talked about how we're supposed to look at Scripture. If we're going to grow, we've got to look at it intellectually. Right? We've got to have intellect. We've got to have an intimacy with, with God. There has to be an intimacy with inside of us. And we also got to look at it obediently. But until all them strains are fit together, we're either going to live in legalism or we're going to live in emotionalism or we're going to live in this intellectualism. It's got to be this central location that way we can grow and expand on this. But can I tell you something? God's talking about what he did at Calvary has been added to and taken away. And he said, it should nothing ever come against me and the cross that I gave. We cannot shape the altar correctly. We cannot shape salvation correctly. We cannot shape grace to what we want it to be. He said, it's not supposed to be touched by your own hand. How do we live out this commandment? How do we work this out while we live under this magnificent amount of his grace? I think about what the cross means to me. But if we're not careful, we'll worship the cross and not the sacrifice. I think about what the manger means. But if we're not careful, we'll think about the manger and not the lamb. We will worship uh, the building and not the cornerstone. Do you see where the problem lies? We'll get caught up in everything God's made and worship it rather than the Creator. Since we're real close, I, I, I want to finish these verses here. Exodus chapter 24, and I want to read through verse 6 because we get the full contrast here of what he's trying to say. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not uh, bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I am the Lord thy God. I am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children and to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. This is the same thing that we learned over there in, in, in 1 John chapter 5. It says, if you love me, the love of God is for you to keep his commandments and they would not be grievous. 
unto you. They won't be grievous unto you. You see, but we get caught up in the wonders of symbols. We struggle with uh, uh, something tangible. He even directed them when they built the altar to not make anything like me. Do not make an evil, do not anything in the sky under the earth. Nothing, nothing, because you cannot contain God. You get that? God is uncontainable. Uncontainable. I think about when Thomas, he says, not until I put my finger into the scars or to the nail prints in his hands, I will not believe. You see how we work? We want to live by sight, not by faith. I'll turn over there real quickly. John chapter 20, you might want to jot this down. I won't stay here long. I want to see this. I want to tell you the response that Jesus gave to Thomas. In verses, uh, you can read this through verse 24 through 29, but I want to get to the part of verse 27 for the, uh, for sake of time. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach rather thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My God, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. God wants us to move away from symbols and understand that he's omniscient. He's om, uh, uh, omni, uh, omnipotent and he's also omnipresent. There is no way that you can contain God. No symbol, no trinket, no imagery, no crucifix, no cross, no religion, no amount of what you add to grace. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, we're not going to go over there, it starts talking about that you should not add to or take away. Because any time that we touch something, it's graven. It's touched by our hands. Don't try to contain them in some type of imagery, picture, statue, crucifix, stained glass. Yeah, I threw stained glass in there. Don't make a plaque on the seat some type of God either. Oh, yeah, that happens. Let's bring this into the New Testament. Let's go over here to Colossians <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 18. And if y'all listen real fast, I'll talk real fast, and we'll be done real fast. All right? Y'all don't believe that. He said, don't lie in the pulpit, preacher. All right, Colossians, we're going to get there before I do. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18, it says this. It says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Do you get that? Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Can I tell you something? How nobody ever saw God. Nobody can put them in any form. Nothing. Stay right here. I'm not going to take you back over there, but I'm going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Just jot it down. And I, I, want, to, I want you to see what he was talking about here. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 15 and through 20 it says, it, but let's just look at verse 15. If you turned over there, it says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude 
on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female. God says, you never saw me, and there's no way that you can make anything that looks like me. So how do we get past this? I'm going to move forward. How do we worship God without any graven image? You've got to worship him in spirit. You worship him in spirit and in truth. Not a pilgrimage. Not some work. Not some deed. None. Do you get that? None of that. You've got to worship him in spirit. Well, how do we receive the spirit to be able to worship him? It's through our salvation. When we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. He comes and lives inside of us. He makes a home to help us understand the mindset of God, the mysteries of God. How do we know God? It is through his mindset that we receive through him, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It also tells us that we can't please him in the flesh. The only way to be able to please him is through the spirit and through our, what? Our understanding of his heart, and we get that. So we've got to worship him in spirit and in truth and not bought up in some type of crazy form. I had a guy not long ago, he sent me this picture, and he said, I understand if I stand in this picture or this this, this place, and I tell you what it is, it's a, Wiccan, it's a Wiccan symbol. But I get all kinds of questions and stuff on uh, uh, on Messenger, and I go over there, and I, I, I try to talk about this, but it's the whole thing of Wiccan. He said, I understand if I stand in this, then, then there's a wall of protection. No evil spirit can get a hold of me. I said, buddy, I said, I ain't trying to to bust your bubble or something, I said, but the only way you're going to have protection from an evil spirit is through the Jesus Christ and the blood at Calvary. So many people are thinking that God can be trapped in some type of a perpetual box or some trinket or some building. What do you tell the Samaritan woman? Well, I thought we were supposed to go up here into the mountain. Well, I thought we had to Jerusalem. He says, no. He said, one day, the true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4. How do we worship the Lord? Intelligently. We know that he can't be contained. Huh? We know that he cannot be contained. This building can't hold him. Can I tell you something? This Bible can't even hold him. He can't be bound in words. If you gave a task, what if I told you to write a 5,000-word essay on God? I don't even think 5,000 words would be enough to try to explain it. There's just no words that can describe how big God is. We've got a solar system. It's amazing. We've got all these stuff. God is telling us that we cannot worship him unless we identify him as the great Jehovah God, bigger than anything that there ever was in this world universe. Listen, he made the atom. Do you get that? And the atom is what everything is comprised about. And there's nothing that's made by the atom that can show how holy and true he is. Do you get that? There cannot be any graven image about him. We've got to worship him in spirit and truth, intimately. We've got to know him. We'll never worship him properly until we know him as our Lord and Savior and what he did for us to take away our sin, intimately and obedient. What, let's just go up here and then we'll close, right? Let's go back to Exodus 20. I want to read the last part of, uh, of, of 6 here for us. I'm over here in Genesis again, guys. Look, verse 6. Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God says, 
don't try to contain me. I am incontainable. I'm bigger than anything that you could ever imagine that I am. I sent a son to you to die at Calvary, grace, intimate, and obediently. Do not add to or take away from my grace. I shall not have any graven image before me. Let's pray. Lord, a gracious Heavenly Father, God, as we think about all this and what it means, God, we may be thinking that, man, I've got some graven images. They've, been, they've become more than, than a remembrance. They became something that I idolized. And, and you tell me that I should have nothing. I, I, I can't contain you. God, help me to, to remove any graven image, any uh, uh, imagery, any trinket, anything that, that I have put in front of you. God, help me not to add or take away from grace, not to add and take away from Scripture, not to add and take away from the law, but that I see it for what it is. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you help me, and Lord, help this congregation to to honor you and these commandments not to be grievous unto you because we want to show just how much we love you and you've showed us your heart by giving us these ten commandments. God, I pray right now as we go into the invitation time that maybe a heart's been touched, maybe it's been moved, maybe they got the question and they just want to say after service and ask. God, I just pray, Lord, have your will in your way in this invitation. In Jesus Christ's name.